and Marshall Vlasic, agent extraordinaire. Kate Hyman, A&R executive at BMG. Deborah Rathwell, senior VP of AEG. Okay, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank you, uh, brave souls, for venturing out in a uh, corona world. Um, those of you who might be watching this on video on YouTube years from now, or weeks from now, or whatever, um, it happens to be also a, a, a Jewish holiday called Purim. And uh, we're uh, in the midst of this uh, corona uh, situation. And um, the one other thing I have to admit is I am very much a pedestrian when it comes to baseball. So you'll excuse me if I don't know the nuances and understandings of a thing, just an average guy watching on TV once in a while, once in a while. So um, tonight, um, venturing out into the wilds here of, of Wayne, New Jersey, um, and leaving uh, the safe harbor of Corona Lake in New York City, is uh, Shlomo Lippitz. And uh, I challenge you to say that five times fast without messing it up. But anyway, um, Shlomo is the vice president of, uh, and, and, and in charge of the booking for a uh, club that started in New York and now is national, City Winery. Any of you been to a City Winery? Okay, just some of us veterans, okay. Well, um, you'll probably want to change that uh, in the future because they've just opened, or in the process of opening a brand new facility in Manhattan. Um, their Tribeca facility has been uh, taken over by the Disney organization and they found a brand new spot and it's gonna be state of the art. Um, and uh, got great talent lined up for its uh, opening festivities and so keep your eye on it. I encourage you to maybe look on, online uh, and check it out because um, in this day and age, there's not too many places like that that will provide the entertainment of that caliber as well as it's just, it's just a decent place to see something and um, you can sit down, you can have a glass of wine mm -hmm. and you can, you can eat. But So Shlomo is not a native of New York. Um, although he probably feels like one at this point, having spent enough time here, but he was born and raised for the first few years in Tel Aviv. First 21 years. 21 years. And as you told me, um, you came to America because you were offered a scholarship in San Diego. Yep. So maybe before we get into that, you could tell me a little bit about how you got from Tel Aviv to San Diego, what, what was going on in your life before City Winery? Um, you know, Tel Aviv is a great coastal city in the Middle East and very much a happening place with a vibrant music scene and a good culinary experience at middle school, high school, and then like most Israelis uh, were, had to take part in a three-year mandatory military service. Uh, I found out just a couple weeks before I was supposed to go into the army serving um, in, the, in, the, in a military unit. Uh, I got word that I got a special um, athletic scholarship that basically would allow me to continue to play baseball throughout my military service and uh, follow my dream of becoming a baseball player, um, which was my dream at the time. So after three years, basically the first week after I got out of the military service where most Israelis end up going and traveling around the world and going to India and South America, um, I decided to go, on, go to San Diego and uh, follow my dream and uh, play, and basically got admitted to UC San Diego where I played four years and went to school over there, great campus, um, good, city to go to if you're into the surfing and outdoors. Um, so that's pretty much how I got to, to, to the States and, and was lucky enough to, to play ball for a long time and music was just a hobby. But, you know, 
you're, you're not referencing some of the amazing teams and international situations. You, I mean, you're not just a kid who went to college and played ball on the. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you if you ask the average Israeli and you tell them that you know a Israeli baseball player, they would most likely tell you uh, that they didn't know that baseball exists in Israel, or they're or you're full of it, basically. Um, so I, I was actually visited the States when I was 10 years old. Uh, my uncle took me to see a Met game in 86, got caught up on the game, came back, asked my uh, classmate in second grade if he knew what baseball was. He told me his dad plays softball. We ended up basically starting the first team ever in Israel. And uh, I've been playing for the national team since I was 10 years old. So um, that's kind of been a light motif for me throughout my my life now for, for 30 years. So uh, while most, I would say, most um, athletes, musicians uh, have a, a role model, which I think is a big part of wanting to become something. I never had a role model because baseball never really existed. And I, back then there was no internet, there was only one TV station. So I would basically, only my, connect, my only way to connect to baseball was through some baseball cards that family would send me. Um, so my dream was actually never to play professional baseball, was to play baseball in college. Um, I guess that's what happens when you're not exposed to baseball and to the options and opportunity you have as a major league player. So once I actually made it through my military service, still played baseball, I was actually even considering leaving Israel before I was turning 18 because I thought to myself, well, most professional athletes really hit their stride when they're 18 years old, and if I go to the Army, what prospect do I have to really play at age 21? But like I said, I, I got into this program that only about 20 or 30 athletes get a year. That allowed me to continue to train. And then um, when I walked on in campus, I was like, hi, my name is Shlomo Lipitz. I had a much heavier accent then. Uh, I was wearing really even tighter clothes because I was coming straight from the uh, dance scene of the club scene of Tel Aviv. Um, and uh, I want to play baseball, and it's, you know, it's a complete. It was a complete different shock. You know, obviously, if you're an athlete in the United States, you get looked at since you know, since you're a young, young lad. And uh, I was already a grown man at that point, but uh, they get, took a chance on me, and you know, end up playing quite a few years. And luckily, uh, I still play to this day, and I think as uh, as a 41 year old. Still is a as a big hobby for me, and I'm, um, I'll get to go if it doesn't get canceled to play and represent Israel in the Olympics this summer. So um, I just hope it's not going to be one of those like in 20 years. I remember that one time I almost <laughs> went to the Olympics and the coronavirus just. <laughs> well, you were on the Olympic qualification uh, team in Italy last year, right? Yeah, I mean we I've I've. And after, years after I stopped playing professional ball, I got the opportunity in 2013 and 17 to play for Team Israel in the World Baseball Classic. In, 19, in 2017, we beat Korea and Netherlands and Cuba and finished sixth in the world. And then um, this past summer, um, I, I've, I've, we were able to qualify. We won 22 out of 25 games. Uh, one may ask, how do I still play baseball with a real adult job? And my, uh, my response would be, if you start a new job, I think the first instinct is to say, oh, well, I want to prove myself, and I'm not going to go on this annual family vacation that I go every year. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to, go to this or this or, that, or to a certain thing because I want to impress. Create facts on the ground from day one. And from day one, when I started working for City Winery, even before when I was interning, for Michael Dorf, who's the owner, I told him, I'll give you my heart and soul, but once a year, I go play baseball for Team Israel. And so that's it's ingrained in you, because I, I just realized you were in Little League when you were... Yeah. So this is a passion of yours that is still with you. And I think 30 years is, is, would qualify as a passion, I guess so, yeah, but it's... Uh, you know, it's it's. I think it's important for every person, no matter what you do, to have some type of hobby. And I just, I was lucky to to play and and have a hobby that allowed me to, you know, go around the world and play and have fun. So, how does a guy who's, you know, 
so well versed in the sport of baseball, all of a sudden make this career thing where you're working as an intern in a New York City nightclub? Well, I think uh, when I was 25 and about a year, you know, I, I started college when I was 21. So unlike you guys, I, I, I started late. Uh, I think it was 25 or 26 at the time. And I said, and I, my girlfriend at the time said, well, well, you're not making millions yet, right? Because, you know, uh, most baseball players who play and follow their dream as a minor league or minor leagues don't make it to the big leagues. I wasn't making hundreds of thousands of dollars. And um, I just graduated a year before. And like most people who graduated from college, I'm, didn't, I, I graduated in, in poli-sci, uh, international relations, and I they can't really. There's nothing really a profession that it could take me. So, um, my girlfriend at the time was like, "What do you love doing?" Which sounds like a simple cliche question, and that was a couple of years after Napster kind of got launched, and I was uh, I was obs obsessed about collecting music. Um, you know, Napster. What what Napster gave me was the ability to basically. Uh, that was before, uh, you know, Spotify, for those who don't know. But it's basically allowed you to access people's library and download all their music. Um, so let's say you were looking for a certain artist, and it would give you, okay, this guy has this artist, and then you would discover 50 other artists that you've never heard of. So at the time, again, it's digital music, so you could be a hoarder without, you know, ever any, anyone, you, anyone know. You know, if you're hoarding records or hoarding tapes or hoarding stamps, you probably have, you know, piles. If you're hoarding music, it fits in a couple of small hard drives. Um, so I took a couple of uh, classes actually in a junior college in, in San Diego. And, and uh, my dream at the time was, okay, well, maybe I'll become a music supervisor. Because anywhere I would go, if it was a restaurant, if it was to a restaurant, watching TV, it would, it would always just have this kind of like, well, I, I can't believe they're playing this song, or I can't believe they're doing that. And just I was very aware of just how much music has an impact on on on, uh, on everything in our lives, even if we're not aware of it. Most people are not real aware of it. And I had a professor who was a great professor at the time and said, you know what, don't even get into music supervision. Music supervision, for those who don't know, it's basically licensing music for shows and and since it's so hard to license and so hard to, um, uh, to, to find a lot of times the, the people who own the music, really you end up, uh, and, and at the time I think uh, uh, there were a couple of movies I really liked, there's a, now the way they do it, there's these massive databases where they have similar music to the originals. So let's say you type in, I want a angry teen, teen Angry teenager, and it will pop up with a bunch of music. So it's not—it's it's a very competitive profession. My girlfriend got into Parsons Fashion School in New York, moved with her, and I did what I guess someone who has no idea how to start in the music business. And I went on Craigslist and uh, responded to an ad that said small Jewish music label is looking for an intern. I walked in. It was probably the first time I wore a suit since my bar mitzvah. <laughs> I was sweating, and it was uh, Michael Dorf, and his, actually his assistant interviewed me. And he had, he had a, a label back then. Yeah, I mean, it was so my boss, Michael Dorf, uh, founded the Knitting Factory a long time ago. Knitting Factory was, I would say, came in a time in the early '80s where it was like a, it was a game changer in the New York music scene. It was um, anywhere from like the Lou Reeds to the dude from around the corner who played on a saw. Um, and it was a very wide variety, and it just it was a it gave a home to a lot of great artists. I mean, the Roots first gigs over there, Beck's first gigs were in the Ning Factory, um, and and so that's kind of his inspiration. And then he grew, and as a 21 year old from Milwaukee, he I think uh, didn't have the money to open up on his own, so he had a bunch of investors, which eventually bought him out after he opened up the Ning Factory in L.A. So post Ning Factory. He had a small label, um, two artists by the name of Hannah Rothman and uh, Pharaoh's Daughter. And I really did, didn't do much. It was an internship three times a week. But for some reason, I said to myself, you know what, I'm just going to stick to this, see where it takes me. I was there for 10 hours a day for five days a week, held two jobs, 
to make it uh, to make some you know ends need in, in New York City and after a full year of interning with really doing not much besides just blind faith and something good is going to happen uh, I went back home and he called me and he said hey I'm opening up this place called City Winery do you want to be a part of it so you know I'm I've, I'm a firm believer of internships and I think over the years I've had probably six or seven interns who've interning from interned for a year um, and are all working in the industry and I'm I'm older than you guys, but I'm not old as you are, and I could still say that internship is really the best way to get the foot through the door. I mean, it's so competitive. People spend hundreds of thousands of in school. I'm not saying leave school, but ultimately it's just about are you able to impress someone, and there's no way better than to give, you know, give yourself free, as a free labor and prove yourself and go above and beyond. So um, I've pitched that, and I think that helped me find some really great people and committed people. And um, I'm not saying you should go intern, but it's definitely a good way to, you know, not go back to school after you don't know what to do or if you're trying to get into a job that is very competitive. Uh, I think today, more than ever, uh, they're not really looking for people. It's much easier to get, you get through, uh, your, your foot through the door even if without your doctorate, even without, you know, a second or third degree. It's just about finding and, and proving yourself. So, that's kind of how I got into. So when you got when you said you want to be part of this, so what was your part of it? What did you start at? Start well, of course, after interning for a year, not even getting my 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 uh, subway card paid, he still found a way for the first three years to pay me slave money. Um, it, it just uh, really nothing. Um, but, but you paid a lot of money to go to college. Exactly. So that's how I justified to myself. Right. I'm like, you know what? Instead of going back to school and, and, and really suffering through that and still not knowing what I want to do, um, you know, I, this is what I want to do. I love this. And um, so it started, City Winery started as a club that was supposed to have music only three times a week, and the rest of the time was supposed to be open as a restaurant. We opened up in 2008, and there was a massive financial crisis at the time. And Sounds familiar kind of like now, and people were just looking to go out to eat, and we, I think we, we fell in the right place in the right time, and New York is such a competitive, has such a competitive music scene, but there was really nothing besides what used to be the bottom line, and that closed just a couple years earlier, this kind of sit-down adult, you know, room where you could sit down comfortably, eat good food, be treated well, and... Um, and, and not come in, you know, the show is advertised at 8 o'clock and the opener goes on at 10.30 and the headliner goes on at midnight. Or you don't come into a place where, you know, it stinks from beer, which again, it, it, it has a good scene, it, it's a, it has a good place in the music scene, but we were, we filled up a, a, really a square in, in, a, in a place and time that did not exist and I think was a big part of why we're successful. And the way I learned the profession was, you know, the first year I think I um, I had my boss's email and I sent emails on his behalf people didn't, didn't even know I existed so I was like Michael for the first you know 12 months then I was I, I graduated what, when you say you send emails to whom to agents you know so you uh, were reaching out to talent I'm reaching out to talent um, spending a lot of time in the venue you know I was spending a lot of time with artists just asking like what makes for you a traveling artist who, who goes who's basically does not have a home and is always on the road and is always in these green rooms and always in the clubs. What makes a club one better than the other? And, and I think I did not have a life. The first few years I was probably there 320 nights a, a year, but it was, it was great feedback for, from, from musicians that are spending you know 150 dates on a year on tour. They were saying, they hate when they come into a, a venue and the only person they meet is this scary security guy and, and there's no real face to the, to, to the venue. Um, you know, they're coming, they're spending their time and, and then all they meet is a security guy and that's it and then there's some kind of, you know, green room server. They told me that, you know, they hated when they go in and played sold out shows and they, after the show they want to go have a beer on the, on the bar and and the bartender charges them for a beer. Like, how much does a beer cost a, a, a bar owner, you know, after, especially after a sold out show? Is it 50 cents, 70 cents? You know, so that's what they remembered, you know, from, from, from a place. Um, 
not, ha not being treated well. And that's really kind of the fundamentals and I'm, something I'm very proud of, which exists in all the city wineries. And I could talk later about how challenging it is to kind of copy paste and, and try to create this culture in every location that we're opening without actually being there and installing these kind of like these fundamentals of how we want to treat the patrons, how we want to feed, treat the artist. And when you have someone who's like 6'4", and his name is Shlomo, and he's there, and I, the first couple of years I was, I was saying hello to them, helping them move all the gear inside, the, helping them load. I was the one scheduling the sound engineer. I was the one uh, taking their orders from, you know, uh, uh, in the green room. I was the one paying the check. You know, the, they always remember the person who gives the check. Um, and ultimately spend some time for them, and now, they're, now you're a face and you're a name, and now when the manager tells them, oh, where do you want to play? Do you want to play LPR? Do you want to play City Wire? Do you want to play Highline? They're like, ah, oh, let me play this. I remember the Shlomo guy. He's a cool guy. Let's, let's, let's play that room. And, and that personalization was something I think was key, and, and what I heard later that those same artists that played the first couple of years, they travel, they hang out sometimes in the same places, they interact, and they're word to mouth, word to mouth, hey, there's this club in New York, they really take care of, good, good care of you, they feed you the steak, they don't give you the children, you know, the children's menu, and they give you that extra beer if you want, and they, and they, and they start on time, and their staff is professional, and guess what, when you're, uh, you know, when you're playing, the bartender doesn't decide to pour five buckets of ice during a, an acoustic show, and the servers, you know, when they're not serving the tables, they're standing behind poles to, to not interfere. And, and, and oh my God, we, I opened for this show for this artist at City Winery and the opener, as an opener, there was not a single person who was talking in the room and they were respecting me the same way they were respecting the headliner. And this one person was talking and they shished him, which was unheard of. So... That's kind of the, how I, I kind of grew. So going back to the email, so I started as Michael, then I was assistant to Michael Dorf, then I had to be Shlomo, but copy Michael on all the notes, and then slowly I'm like, now I don't even tell him what's going on. Um, but that's, so I, I, and, and that was a privilege that really we don't have now, because back then we were a new business. There wasn't the pressure that we have now we started with three shows, and the first year I think we had 120 shows. Second year we had 250 shows, and we've not had a dark night at City Winery for six or seven years, including New Year's Day, including Christmas, where we do some Jewish comedy show. Um, so I had the privilege to kind of really grow and kind of learn the profession. Whereas now if we open up a City Winery in Philadelphia, we're expected to sell at every single show seven days a week from day one. Because now we have investors, and now we have, you know, eight million dollar build out, and so on and so forth. What's interesting is you talked about bands come in and they develop a liking to the way you run things, and they share that information with other bands that they meet while on the road, and I call that networking. And I try to emphasize to students today that whether it's working in a club with bands or anything you do. If you have the opportunity to be an intern, networking is how you get from point A to point B. If people hear good things about you, or you meet the person sitting next to you in the class here, or you, you just don't know. So you meet the same people as you go on the way up, you might meet on the way down, but the point is you always you look to the left, you look to the right, and see who that is, and maybe you're going to realize that, that somebody's there, they're going to be there for you, or maybe they're just passing through, but you don't know. So I always say, be nice to everybody, as, as, you, as you've proven. And in the long run, it pays off, because people talk. And we paid well. And it's, you know, there, there, there's, there are many reasons. I mean, uh, there are many ways they could go wrong if you're in the music business. And I think um, uh, when I, when I first couple of years, when I was going to conferences and I was meeting all these counter folks who are working at, in the industry, um, all over the United States, and I just saw the, the spectrum. There's no school for talent buying. There's no school for these things. It's really intuition and instincts, right? I mean, you have to be able to have the courtesy if you see someone, uh, if, if you see an artist is feeling uncomfortable, is like knowing when do you impose yourself and when do you leave them go. You know, there's, 
when 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 is it a right time and when is it when is it a wrong time um and really just have your eyes and ears open again these all seems like, seem like clichés but i would not get the job if i wasn't really giving have this kind of blind faith and just persistency on 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 on, on believing to doing the right thing and you know worked out for me in this regards so what's a typical day in the life of shlomo Well, a typical day today is very different than a typical day eight, ten years ago. Today, a typical day is probably between 600 and 700 emails a day. Um, I, I basically have a glorified uh, office job. Um, to give you a little idea on the structure, so we do about uh, six to 700 shows a year in each location because we have a 300 capacity and a 150 capacity. You should talk rooms. about how many locations are there now. So we have seven locations with 13 venues. Every venue is basically doing seven days a week programming unless there's a private event, a wedding, a corporate event, a wine tasting, whatever. Um, baseball, in a lot of ways, is like uh, music business, uh, booking. It's a game of failures. I mean, you're, if you're hitting three out of ten, you're a Hall of Famer. If you're actually confirming three artists out of ten offers you send out, you're a successful talent buyer. So... To imagine every location has to book 600 shows, 600 times eight or nine or 10, and I basically have to approve every single offer. So if we have offers coming in, I basically, you know, so what we do is as a team, because we have seven talent buyers, it's such a big job that every different, every city has their own, pro, we call it programmer, not a booker, because that's another whole thing, right? If you're a talent buyer, some of these rock clubs are talent buyers, and, and basically, like someone, a place like Bowery Ballroom or Music Hall of Williamsburg or Webster Hall, um, they do very little proactive booking. They basically sit down and it's a hot room and agents cool. send a note and say, hey, we are routing this artist, Tim Ampala is, play, you know, is playing to play in New York, can you please give us the veils in this and this dates? And they, that's it. If they don't, and a lot of times during the summer when artists don't tour as much, you'll see dark nights all the time. Like, Bowery Ballroom is probably closed five out of seven days during the summer because they don't do proactive booking. And if artists don't reach out to them or agents don't reach out to them to book shows, they don't book shows. We like to view our job in City Winery as programmers because we have these amazing opportunities to, and, and we have to, to be able to book seven days a week, we have to program it. And I think that says a little bit of how we approach music. It's, for example, um, we're doing the music of... Uh, oh, we did Patti Smith 70th birthday, so we put together 12 artists to all celebrate with Patti Smith her birthday. Or, uh, you know, Lenny Kay did the, this project with Garage Rock called The Nuggets in, um, in, the, in the late 60s, so we reenacted the three, albums, the three albums of The Nuggets, and we put together a bunch of artists. And, and the thing is that, uh, that we've... That's, that's a program. That's a program, yeah. Right. And, and it's curated where... We're putting, we're reaching out to artists. We're using our relationships, and to be honest, what we've learned is that artists need the venue as much as the venue needs the artist. And I'll give you an example. Um, for years, every time there was some kind of catastrophe, let's say there was, you know, the um, uh, earthquake in Japan. Okay, artists don't really, besides social media, they don't have a way to express, and they need a stage to be able to express. They want to raise money for the efforts, the, the relief efforts. We're there for them and, and we use each other, so we provide for them a stage for them to play, donate their time, and raise money for different causes. That's kind of a, how we approach things. So every programmer sends an offer. Everyone else on the team is copied, so they're kind of aware of what's going on. Because if you're a creative person and you're sitting in the office, and there's like the beverage director and the service director and the us, Programmers and musicians need to be stimulated, and I think a good way that we've overcome this otherwise stagnant environment is basically copying each other on emails. Oh, blah, blah, you're putting an offer for Todd Rundgren in Chicago? Oh, I'll reach out to the agent. Maybe it's a good idea to, 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 to have this person play too. So um, most of my day are emails. I oversee also all the marketing department, but then again, I need to go out and network with people, go see shows at night, Um, when we have a venue open, I s spend a lot of time walking around, making sure that 
you know, small stuff like, you know, our, our, our postcards promoting the right shows. Uh, are we promoting Klezmer Brunch doing a Taj Mahal show? Probably not the best idea, you know. And, and when, when you're doing a show, everyone's running around doing their own thing. So I just kind of use it to hover around and kind of just make sure that things are the way we want it to be because most people don't come from an environment that cares so much about the artist and so much about a listening environment and a culture of, of, of music, which is something that's really important for us. What's the average age of an artist that plays City Winery? I think we've done a pretty good job. I would say the average age of the artist and the fans, the first five or six years, was probably in their late 40s to early 70s. Mm -hmm. But over the years, we've kind of We've really, I think, it, two things contribute to the fact that the average age of the artists and the fans came down. One, wine, which used to be, even 10 years ago, used to be considered, ah, uh, only old people drink wine. I think wine is, is everywhere. There's so many wine, wine bars and the, the culture of wine is much better. And secondly, it's a great place for, if you're on a date, it's a great place to go on a date, right? So folks like Citizen Cope or folks like, um, uh, like Rhett Miller's or the Ted or the the the, the um, uh, Teddy Thompson's, you know. We, so we, we we have a much more diverse mix of artists, and that has to do also with just the willingness of the artists. And we broke a lot of glass ceilings of of what artists would normally want to play City Winery, but also it has to do with the fact that we position ourselves. So let's say there's a band that only travels with a full band, and it's a really rocking rockin' show. So when they're coming, f supporting an album with a full band, they'll play a Webster Hall, they'll play a Town Hall, they'll play a much bigger room because they're touring with a much bigger, with a much bigger crew. But then I say to them, say to them, why don't you come d back on a shorter cycle and maybe do an acoustic tour? Someone like Josh Ritter, who normally plays with a full band, we we approach it saying, hey, let's not do a normal Josh Ritter show. He's working on a new album. The whole show is just new material, just to see he could perform 20 songs, just new material, see if it sticks. So that was kind of the angle that we found on that specific case to get Josh, who normally plays more younger, hipper clubs to do City Winery. <coughs> yes, sir. What's the atmosphere of your City Winery venues? Is it more like casual or um, suit and tie? Like No, 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 no. Very, very, very casual. Um, I would say, so let me just, I would say, walk you through an experience of City Wine, okay? So you, you, we have our own ticketing system. That was something that that's very fits our entrepreneurial spirit of City Wine. We didn't use Ticketmaster. We didn't use TicketWeb, uh, Eventbrite. We decided that, you know what, why? We want to own the information. We don't want to pay other ticket, ticketing system $2.5 or $7 or $10 for commission. And it took us a lot of my investment, but we, own, we have our own ticketing system. So when you go online, you choose a ticket and we're paperless. You choose a seat from a specific, from a map, you get a, you get a confirmation number, and you don't ever need to print a ticket. You don't even have to do a barcode. So you walk in, and as you walk in, there are three hostess with iPads are going, saying, hi, sir, welcome to City Winery. How can I help you? And then you say your name. And then from there, you have another group of about six people that are waiting next to them all young, beautiful men and women uh, taking you to your specific seat, having a conversation with you, saying, hey, sir, welcome back to City Wine, or is this your first time? Do you know we make wine? So it's a, from day one, you know, I would say the average person who goes to see a show, you're probably like, ID, please. Mm -hmm. Come in, do this, do that. And it's a, it's a very, so from the start, it's a much more hospitable. I mean, we are see ourselves, we're a music venue, but we see ourselves in the hospitality uh, world. So once you walk in, unlike most clubs where it's all dark walls and it's kind of stingy and, and, and smells like, it's all wood, it's warm wood, and it's like, I can't say comfortable seating, but it's family style seating. Um, you get to eat food and not like greased up food. It's not the best food. I would not say I would go to City Winter for a standalone culinary experience, but it's definitely a upgrade than most venues and then guess what it said on the website that the doors open at six and it says the show starts at eight. Oh my god it's eight oh five the show actually started you know so the the time management of 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 the people that come we're, we're very very conscious about it 
You know, we're thinking our fans, even if you don't, let's say you're too young to have kids, but let's say you have kids, you have a babysitter, you want to do other stuff, you want to be able to be home at 10.30 because you want to watch whatever on TV. So that's kind of your experience uh, of, of City Winery, uh, normal, I would say a normal experience of City Winery. And there's no dress code. There's no dress code. And no suit and tie. It's, although do, it's a, one of those places where I think all the musicians always choose to bring their, invite their parents and their family to go to City Wine. It's like, yeah, mom, this is where I always play, you know. Um, but it's, uh, I think the first instinct is, you know, oh, do I have to dress up? You know, it's not Carnegie Hall. Um, it's, it's very uh, loose in that regards. I have a question. Is there like a drink minimum too? No drink minimum. That's another thing. That also, when we started City Winery, we're like, you know what? Even if I was planning to spend two hundred dollars, the fact that someone told me that I have to spend two hundred dollars pisses me off. <laughs> so um, we have a lot of people who order water, but that was a conscious decision that probably is not the most smartest financial. But if you want to come in, and you want to drink iced tea, five iced teas, you could do that. There's going to be no minimum. Yeah. Okay. So tell me about wine. I mean, we know that wine is much more of a coveted situation now, but so when well, you have somebody in the back stomping on grapes, I mean, how does that, how does that work? Well, the con the, when you think of the idea, it's kind of like dumb, like, okay, well, you're, you're, you're making wine in an urban environment where the rent is really high, and guess what? The grapes do not, are not grown in, in the subway. So, uh, but we decided to do this as a concept, and I think it's, it's part of who we are. As a, it's a story, right? So, seventy percent of the wine that people drink at City Winery is wine that we make on the spot. So we bring the grapes. Every location brings about buys about one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty tons of grapes from Chile and Argentina and California and Oregon and upstate New York, and we ship the grapes. And we have a head French winemaker, so it very much fits the whole, the whole oh yeah, Medus wine. Uh, and same like programmers, we have a, uh, a junior winemaker in every, every location and we go through the whole process. We do the sorting of the grapes and we bring in volunteers and we, we involve the fans to be, you know, touch the grapes and we do the fermentation in the tanks. And after that it goes and we press the wine and we actually use the peels of the grapes in our dough and our pizza dough to self-sustain and we um, then pump the wine into barrels where the wine ages for 10 to 14 months and then we serve the wine on tap. So most of the wine that you drink at City Winery is wine that never doesn't have any sulfites, no preservatives and uh, the cool thing about it is like most artists when they go on the road or fans, they end up buying the same t-shirt, the same keychain, the same CD. We actually, for every artist that plays City Winery, we make a special wine label for them and sell it as merchandise. So, and people always love seeing their face on a bottle of wine. So for the fan who's bought every single t-shirt and every single piece of merchandise, now we have, they could buy like a little souvenir. We pay the artist $10 for every bottle we sell and um, we use that as kind of a, a cool story. And, and the design of the venue is, okay, how do you, so when you walk into every venue, you'll see some windows with stock barrels and you'll have people giving out samples of wine and kind of that's, again, part of, a, of our story. So does each, you said each facility has a, a, a winemaker on, on staff. Is each facility making their own or is there... Yep. So the wine I get in Nashville will be distinctively different than the wine I get? Not distinctly, I would say as a, as a, as a head winemaker, you have a certain style right. that you want to impose as far as the winemaking and philosophy about winemaking. I mean, there's a million philosophies. So those people are really artists as well. Um, but I would say different grapes, different grape varieties sometimes, and definitely you could tell some distinctions between one to one. And just so there's no confusion, there's also a regular bar. So if you don't want wine, yeah. you can have... Correct. Usual cocktails. Anything. So who, who would you consider, for, like in New York, who is the competition? Because it's a very unique situation, what City Winer has. So who, somebody's looking for entertainment value and they have a discretionary amount of dollars. They have a choice between City Winery and question mark. Who would you say? Well, I would say as a musician, 
Cause if you're, cause that's, that's, booking, and then yeah. So as a musician, if you're if you're an agent, and you're looking. You know, there's like a place like Town Hall, right? It's a historic building. It's a beautiful theater. It fits 1,200 people, and um, but it's a union hall, and that means it's a very expensive room. So in reality, if there's a let's say Graham Nash or you know wants to play, uh, you know, New York. He'll get an offer from City Winery, he'll get an offer from Town Hall. He, even though we could probably pay more money at City Winery, sometimes artists just want to play a certain room. Like, I want to play a theater. I don't want to play a supper club, for example. So <coughs> that artist would play a certain room. Um, a lot of times it comes down to availability uh, and, and money and a bunch of other, and history with the market. Um, as far as direct competition talent-wise, that's one of the reasons why we've been able to sustain ourselves as a business in every location, there's really no one who's doing exactly what we're doing. Right. Um, if you're a f just someone who comes to New York and wants to spend their money, let's put it this way. If you're with a bunch of bros and wants, want to just kind of talk and catch up, City Winery is probably not the right place for you. And we've actually actively told people to leave and give back their money because we feel that it's it, it, it hurts the experience of the artist and experience of the other fans who, or, or, or real fans of the music. So I would say if you want a great listening experience and maybe introducing yourself to a new, an artist you've never heard of, and because I think we have a pretty high level of, uh, of, of threshold of who we want to have play City Winery, you, the, the likelihood of you coming to, City, sing, coming to City Winery and seeing a show you hate, I would say is fairly low. Whereas if you go to some of a you know a club in the East Village, the, the you know the the it could be either great oh my god I can't believe this guy's gonna be a superstar like I can't believe it my ears are bleeding you know so that you don't have that. What is the capacity <coughs> of most of the, the city wineries? Three hundred and one fifty, and and one fifty is kind of our new model. And as a standalone, so you know if we open up a music venue. The reason why there's not a lot of great 100 or 150 capacity rooms is because you could, the opportunity to make money is very low. You know, most artists that play 150 seat rooms, you could only charge 10, 15 dollars a ticket. But if you now put it in a business that already, like a city wine that has already a 300 seat room, then you could start using the same kitchen, the same staff, and it makes much more sense. So, those are kind of the main capacities that we deal with. Uh, the artists work for. Guaranteed plus percentage. So the few, the few type of deals, few types of deal that we play, you know, if, and I could give you a little secret. So if you're playing a Bowery, any of the Bowery presents places, you don't get a guarantee because they think they're such a hot shot, and they are, uh, and they have massive lists, and they have multiple size rooms. So if you're a young artist, you willing to play and then go out, they just do flat door deals, sixty five percent of the door. If you make $100, you walk out with $65. If you sold $50 worth of tickets, then you walk out with 65% of $50. We, on the other hand, we do a bunch of deals. We either do a straight door deal, which means you get a certain percent of the door no matter what you sell. If you sell 10,000 tickets, $10,000 worth of tickets, you'll get 70% of that. If you sell $500 worth of tickets, you have 70% of that. So that's one type of deal. Then you have a deal that's called a versus deal. So we're guaranteeing $3,000 versus 70%. So if, the, if, the, if you gross more than $3,000, you're getting 70%, but at least you're walking with a minimum of $3,000. And the third type of deal is just a straight guarantee. Twenty thousand dollars. If you grow, if if the venue sells five tickets, you still owe twenty thousand dollars to the artist. If you sell out and you sell fifty thousand dollars worth of tickets, you still pay twenty thousand dollar guarantee. What, what do most people do? So the logic would be: the bigger artist you are, you'd be like, I just want a percentage deal, and I want just to walk with the mo most amount of money. But the bigger you are, the more you're kind of strict about just I, I want a guarantee. They don't want to. They don't want to around. So it's. Uh, I would say for the bigger artists, it's a flat guarantee. For the medium artists, it's a guarantee versus deal. And then we have some play around. Like, let's say I'm offering an artist $2,000 versus 60%. They say, 
I want more money. I want higher, higher guarantee. I'm like, well, I can't give you a higher guarantee, but I'll give you more on the back end. So if we sell, so I'll give you 70% instead of 60%. So if we sell all the tickets, you'll walk out more, but I'm lowering, my, I'm lowering the risk on my side by keeping the guarantee low. So in case it bombs, um, I'm, I'm not in the hole for, for more money. Well, what happens with merch? <laughs> so merch is a funny thing. So um, you have two, if you're having an artist over here, they'll say, well, I'm carrying the merch. The people that are buying the merchandise are my fans. Um, I've been schlepping around everywhere in a bus or in a car with the merchandise. I should be getting all the money, right? <laughs> I'm on the venue side. I'm saying, I'm giving you the store. I'm paying rent. I'm giving you this table that you're sitting, you know, sitting next to. I'm sitting, giving you this chair. I sold the tickets and promoted and marketed all these people that are here or here because I help let them know. So we should get a percentage. So in reality right now, for a long time, by the way, venues were not getting any, any money from, from it. And now it's a normal merch deal is 80% goes to the artist and 20% goes to the venue. The big, next, the big thing now is all these artists are now having these VIP experiences right. where they're selling these VIP experiences. The agent is not getting anything. And all of a sudden someone says, oh, by the way, um, we're coming in. We're engaging this company. They're going to charge $200 for this VIP experience. And the artist is keeping 100% of, of, of it. And then I say, well... Hello. We, we, we're bringing the staff here. It's our store. We're having a security guy make sure that everything's okay. Oh, that's okay. If you don't want it, we could go to the bar across the street. So there's now this whole thing now that, that it's, that's the newest thing in the industry that there's a lot of <coughs> fight over. It's, it's how, do you, um, how do you deal with these third-party VIP experiences. Meet so that's greet. kind of me and greets. Uh, Give me a signed poster plus a photo plus a chance to bump, see a song. bump fists. Yeah, bump fists. You had a question back there. Yeah. So, as for the artists that have a smaller fan base that might not be headliners necessarily, are you guys booking them based on how many tickets they can sell, or is it more like talent based for the well, clients coming in? Well, we're unfortunately we're if you're a, an artist who's completely unknown and don't have any following, I mean. W it's very hard for a business. We have such a large overhead. Our business model does not allow just taking reckless risk. You know, that, but there's rooms, and, and God bless those rooms. I mean, Rockwood, for example, uh, and there used to be more rooms like that in New York, like pianos, and, and where tickets are either free or cheap, and 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 people come over there because they know they're going to see great music, no matter who it is, and the, and the name doesn't really matter. It's really important, and, and there's not a lot of rooms like that. For, from our perspective, we, our policy is we don't impose on the headliners an artist that they don't want. So let's say you send me a note, hey, Shlomo, I have this band. It's really great. We don't have much to follow. I would love to open for Lucinda Williams or to open up for Citizen Cope next month. I don't make that decision. What I will do, I will give, give it my little quality control listen, see if it's good, and then I would send it to the management of the headliner because they like to have control. And I understand that. If you're traveling, you want to make sure that the artist that's opening for you is, you know, not a crazy, not a, that it's somehow it fits, right? Um, so if, for example, if you're, if the headliner is playing solo, we're probably not going to book a full band to be open for the, for the show. <laughs> Um, if you're a jazz trio, we're probably not booking a hip hop, you know, trio to to open up for jazz. So, I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, we we deal with a lot of these. I mean, that's, and the question that I get a lot is, how do you? I want to. How do I get into City Winery? How do I play City Winery? And people, there's there's no one way. I mean, in the one hand, I get people who send you know ten paragraph emails. But then again, I get six, seven hundred emails a day, most likely, and I think this is a pretty good, I would say, example of the of the industry these days. If you most people in an email that they don't know from someone that they don't know on, on a topic that they're 
don't really have patience for, probably are tapering, or tapering off within the first paragraph. So everything after that is probably getting lost in the jumble. Then you have the old schoolers who send a CD. I'm like, I don't, my computer has not had a CD, and my, I don't have a CD, and I had a CD for years. Um, some people are just try to call. I mean, there's really no, no, no good one way, because if there was one way to get you on a show, on a venue, that someone would have wrote, wrote, written the, that book, The Way to Get on a Show. So it's a, a matter of networking, it's a matter of being persistent. Uh, there's no secret ingredients. Mm. Um, so since like the coronavirus outbreak is a big thing right now, I was wondering, we were talking about um, in class, I have a professor though, about um, insurance. So I'm just wondering as far as like for your venues, like what kind of insurance do you have? So it's, it's definitely a hot topic. Yeah. Um, it's a real hot topic. So this is my, so insurance companies apparently uh, a couple years ago when the SARS outbreak came out uh, made sure that uh, pandemics are not covered in insurance. So the vast majority of insurance, actually, you are able to get insurance uh, as a, for a pandemic, but it would be a separate thing. Now, a year ago, if I told you, what's your name? Denzel. Denzel, so I would say, hey, Denzel, you're running this really expensive business, and uh, I'm trying to sell you insurance. Do you want to pay an extra $15 a, 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 a month for a pandemic? Man, you never know. Most likely you're going to say no, because it was like, who would believe that you know we would be where we are right now, so you know we were talking about it earlier. I mean, there's a thing called force majeure, where basically force majeure is a legal term that's really popular in the music business. And usually, when we sign a contract, it's one of those things where you just skip over or, or mark off, and nobody really takes care. And basically, what it means is if there's an act of God, if there is something that's beyond anyone's control, then both sides are are are, are basically or, or f freed from their commitments. So what's going on right now is, as a venue, okay, we have, let's say, 20, 30 shows next month. And we have people that are not buying as many tickets because people are kind of unsure what's going on. And there are artists, are the, and, and, there, and, and people are not spending as much money. And artists are saying, hey, you're canceling, you're canceling. So it's kind of a chicken of a mouse scenario for, for venues because if we cancel on our own, and saying, hey, we're not really selling tickets right now, and we feel really, we feel it's a real risk for the public. We owe the artist the full amount of money. If the artist says, I don't feel comfortable touring right now, then they don't get the money, and we and we get our we get a deposit back. However, if the state says we're declaring a state of emergency and we're not allowing any gathering of any kind beyond 300 people then the force majeure hits, and then you're, you're separated. So the venue, and that's what's happening with festivals. That's why what's happening with South By, that's why they were waiting for so long, is because if South By canceled on their own, then they would owe all the money to all the sponsors and to everyone else. They had to wait for the city to declare a state of emergency, because once a state of emergency is declared, now the insurance could kick in, now... There, you know, the city may be getting more funding from, from, from the federal government that will allow the state to maybe support these promoters a little more. And same thing with Coachella. I mean, they're just, who's going to blink first type of thing? Um, <clears throat> just to amplify what he said, um, City Winery put out an email to many of their patrons um, explaining what their philosophy and what they're doing uh, in, the, in these troubled times, um, and it's very specific, um, talking about how they change their sanitation policy, um, uh, talking to their employees, scheduling extra personnel, um, to the point where you go to a city winery, there's someone else opening the door for you, an employee. Um, and then Let them die, you know, if, as long as you're okay. <laughs> <stop>. <laughs> And they're monitoring the health of the staff so that hopefully they're not dying. But, um, you know, I get a lot of emails, probably somewhere near the amount he gets, but from a different clientele. And 
it's the only venue I know that's taken this attitude and, and position. And of course, they saw, he mentions in his thing about how drinking wine has a positive antioxidant value as well as comforting the soul. So while there's a sales slight angle in there, I mean, the man is very, you know, particular in taking uh, the virus seriously. We got a lot of great feedback because it's like, you don't know, do you want to be proactive and you want to message everyone that it's not happening, you know, the best thing we could do. And, and there, are, I mean, there are so many small businesses that are being hurt right now, um, as you guys can imagine, I mean, from- But if I'm a patron and I bought tickets for a show and I'm a little nervous about going to the show, I can call you guys up and what will you do? Uh, we will give you a store credit and, and so a couple of things if we're, we offered on this letter that if anyone who does not feel comfortable You'll not get your full refund back, but you'll get store credit so you could come to any other show that you choose to And then of course again, we're, we're concerned for the patron. That's a real thing. We're in the live You know live music business and people interact and there's a lot of elderly people and and, 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 and people mixing and eating and sharing food and all we could do is really just do everything that we can to make sure that everyone feels feels safe because it's as much as a psychological uh, as it is physical as as we understand right now. I mean, kudos to you guys because I don't know other <coughs> venues that would do that, and <laughs> our friends in the travel industry certainly wouldn't uh, be as uh, gracious as you guys are offering people. Well, I'll tell you, credit. this came out yesterday. I'll tell you in a week or not if it was a good idea. <laughs> if, <laughs> oh, wow. Well. If nothing else, it's fantastic PR. Yeah. Whether it's a sound financial decision, that's probably another conversation. But you guys are in it for the long haul, and you're opening a new venue, so any positive goodwill, I think, is, is you know, right there. So you had a question. Yeah, on a lighter subject, um, we were talking about opening acts and, and headliners. Do you find that comedy goes with music? Or I don't care which one's the opener. Or which so, or, so, uh, the quick question is yes. Our motto at City Winery is something that kind of a one-liner that we came up with, which I think it really sums up well what our experience is like, is it's about indulging your senses. You know, going to see a live show and, and like you're, you're hearing the music and you're seeing the wood and the warmth and you're tasting the food and you're smelling the wine and all this. And it's, it's a really multiple, multi-senses thing. And, uh, I think there are a couple of acts that have toured uh, that that tour with comedians. I mean, Rhett Miller from the old 97s always has a comedian opening for him. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great thing. I mean, it used to be the case where you know you have a lot of artists open, you have comedians opening for artists. Nothing wrong and a good laugh right. at any time. I know years ago it was there were two different audiences. It was hard. I mean, we've. You know, talking about niches, I mean, we've tried to do R&B and Neo Soul for a long time, and people have just not, the audience has not come down to, to see shows at City Wine, and we've, we've keep fighting it, and it does very well for us in Atlanta and Chicago and Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Same thing with um, comedy. I mean, there's, comedy is kind of like a, you know, certain area in town. When we, when we do Broadway, there's Broadway acts that come in town. They say, oh, well, we do two weeks in, you know, 54 below. And that translates to 100 tickets downtown. So it's, it's island tra uh, kind of a, a, what I like to call, we're in the profession of basically educated guesses. We look at the information, we have instincts, and we guess what ticket prices should be. We guess what we should be paying an artist. We guess if this act could do well or not, and, and based on our history and the instincts, and you know, hopefully you do better more, more times than not. Could you get a little bit more into that? Because you mentioned um, using some history and yeah. so you're collecting, you mentioned you have your own ticketing, so you have collecting all the data and you're recognizing this band is kind of like this band, so you're trying to, or artists. We're trying to do that, but you know, so people always ask, how do you choose what ticket prices will be? I mean, that's a kind of, is it arbitrary? I mean, are we just throwing out numbers? So, we talked about before about an artist that you know needs to get paid twenty thousand dollars a guarantee. As a business, we know to be able to make money as a business, we need to be making twenty six thousand dollars if we're paying an artist twenty thousand dollars. If we know that we need to get to twenty six thousand dollars, what would what ticket prices 
will get you to $26,000. And we do five different tiers in all of our ticking. So we'll do the stage premiere, which you, we believe that there's always 50 people who will pay substantially more money to see their favorite artist up close and then scale it backwards. So, you know, when an agent said, hey, I have this artist touring, the question that I asked the agent is, is there any history, headline history? Because a lot of times they bent, you know, ask, oh, is there any history? Yeah, we sold out Sony Hall. Then I found out it was a radio promo thing. And yeah, there were 600 people over there, but all of them were invites. And I, now, I'm not, now I know why there's only 50 people who bought tickets. Um, so I asked, what is the history of the artist? What is the headline? You know, when's the last time they played? Um, well, what, what, do you, what are your suggested ticket prices? And then what is this golden number that you need to reach? So we kind of, it's a combination of usually working backwards based on the guarantee. And then just knowing the demo, knowing who most of our marketing is done through our email list as opposed to print ad or radio. Um, so we kind of look historically what we've done more and what we feel our list would be into. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was going to ask, since you're a pitcher, how have you taken qualities on the field and applied them to your job? And how have, they, how have those qualities helped? Great question, because when... When you play, college, you play sports, in, uh, sports in college, the coaches always tell you, you're going to get an advantage in life, you're going to learn lessons of life that you, that you learn on the field. And, I, and actually, I've come to believe it. I mean, uh, as a pitcher, I mean, stepping back, you know, taking, the, taking that extra breath, not getting all caught up with, with the drama. I think that's a big thing, I think, for any athlete um, that applies to real life. You know, things tend to speed up when things are going bad and taking a step back and just taking a breather. Um, I think pitchers, the things that I like as a pitcher is a lot of the psychological game, you know, that you have with, with a hitter and you're kind of looking for little cues and keys and stuff like that, so I try to apply that. Uh, I already know all your weaknesses, by the way. No, I'm <laughs> um, so it's just the pause, and I think dedication. I mean, any athlete, or, or, or in, you, in, the, in your case, a lot of you guys, I guess, are musicians, right? Um, the fact that you are going to school, and you have your regular life, and you're giving the dedication and the time to, to, to do something that you love, by, it doesn't matter if you're a great musician or not, if you're going to be a professional musician or not, that by itself gives you an advantage over most people. Because I think, again... For me, baseball was a passion, and to be able to have a passion to go with a day job was key for me. To be able to have three hours a week or ten hours a week where I'm not checking on my iPhone, not checking my phone, not checking my email, that I'm developing, that I'm, I would say, uh, uh, feeding another part of my brain. And this is true about musicians, about athletes, about artists, about anyone. It's it's. Most people don't have that dedication, and that dedication, if you like it or not, is going to translate to anything you do in life. And when you're in the gym at 6 a.m., five days a week, and then you work out, and then you go to classes, and you, get, you have another afternoon workout, and then you have to do your homework, and you're at college and you want to have some fun, guess what? That's, a, that's impressive, and that will, again, will translate to anything you do. So uh, not as necessary as a pitcher, but as someone who's done something else that has a, a big passion, is, that was a big thing for me. And I think, I, I, and I, and I, think I, I love what I do. And there's definitely stuff about what I do and uh, long hours and all that stuff. But that passion, the fact that you're familiar with something that you love so much, I think hopefully it will translate into work. So an agent tells you last time the artist was in town, he sold 600 tickets. Then you find out that it was all those tickets were actually given away. How does that work with your relationship with the agent? How does that make it? doesn't help. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the way I say it is like you know, I'll, there's there's again there, the 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 spectrum and the and 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 the variety of how people conduct their business is very very wide because there's not one way of doing stuff. You're basically you are who your mentor is in the music business. If you're in radio, and you're agent, if you're a manager, if you're a town buyer. So one would think that lying to me and me finding out 
There's no long game. I mean, it, the, the same agent, assuming he has multiple artists <coughs> and wants to do business with you, and now we have seven venues. So if you lie to me, guess what? You're not, I'm not going to book your artist next time. And guess what? I'm going to actively call all my other buyers that work with me so they don't get duped into doing the same thing. Now, there's stuff that, you know, but there's, there's also, the, it, not every show is successful. Let's say Marty Diamond, who's a big agent, you know, he represents anywhere from like Fun to David Gray to Coldplay, right? Those artists were not what they are right now. And there's a certain trust. So there's a so there's certain trust with certain agents that give you good stuff that they may sell you some, something and by the time the show plays, they're probably not representing them anymore because it didn't work out the way you do. So there is a certain trust and risk. But the lying stuff, it does happen once in a while and I have no problem telling that person, you know, to go whatever. And <laughs> what, what would you say is the uh, most successful or well-known genre for City Winery in New York? I would say the singer-songwriter, classic rock, rock type of genre. Although our biggest show by far was Prince, I would say, so that doesn't fall necessarily in that category. Um, I like I I I, re, I truly believe, and I try to pitch it when I. When, and that's I think why we've got over the years such a diversified kind of t talent. There's no such thing as a just standing room show. I think if you if you present it smartly and you bring in the right band with the right configuration, every genre could play at City Winery. I mean, we've had Wycliffe Jean do you know a, a, a kind of. A, a, or, 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 or Riza do like a kind of sm small, condensed, kind of smaller show. And we've had Tower of Power with 20 people on stage, you know, jam on. It's, 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 it's breaking the boundaries of what people think Supper Club. Another thing of why we've, Supper Club, we didn't invent that genre. You consider City Winery a Supper Club? It is. I mean, it, it is what it is. I mean, but Supper Club historically, Supper Club meaning a place where you eat dinner and watch a show. And wear a suit and tie. Without the suit and tie, but um, traditionally those places have always been opened by restaurateurs. Right. And restaurateurs, <clears throat> it's like the classic thing, you know, if you're an NBA player, you want to play baseball. If you're, a, if you're a, you know, if you're Eddie Vedder, you want to talk about this, you don't want to talk about it. Everyone wants to be something else. Yep. And chefs who open up Supper clubs have traditionally all they care about is food, and they don't have this kind of, uh, I would say, sensitivity to the artist and making sure that the, that the artist feels at home, and that the listening experience needs to be. It's for them. It's all about pushing, 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 push, pushing food, which is why it had such a hard, we had such a hard time booking shows at City Winery that were otherwise theater shows, theater artists, someone like Natalie Cole or someone like Ricky Lee Jones who would never play a supper club because any play, any, any, anywhere they played, including the, the bottom line, was always like a very loud, servers were wearing clickety-clack, you know, heels and moving around and not, we not, not, not being respective to everyone else. So we had to kind of break that stigma of what a supper club is, that guess what? If you have questions about the menu and you're sitting this close to the artist, our, our as much as I want to make as much money for City Winery, our server is not going to have a discussion with you about the menu during the show when you're two feet from the artist. I mean, that's how close artists are. So taking these calculated risks and changing the culture of what people think Supper Club what? was as, as was a big key for us to get some of, a lot of, most of the acts that we get today. You had, you had. another question. How long did it take to build the following that you have now, the support with the customers, and uh, did you start like in a densely populated area, like a city? Well, we started in New York in, in a not a densely populated area. Most venues that open don't open up in a high-end place because it's, it's, it's a massive space and we don't have money to start with. What I think, again, something that I'm very proud of what City Winery has become is I always thought of a regular as or, or someone who has the regular as you know the person who goes to the you know neighborhood bar and shoots the shit with a bartender and drinks you know two dollar beers or i see a regular as i love 
coming to the same diner and having the same sandwich every day. We actually have regulars at City Winery and because we build a community. It's because people feel real connection. I mean, we have, we have this membership that's called Vinofile membership that you pay $99 a year and you don't pay credit card fees and you get to buy tickets before the public. And those $99 have bought us a loyalty that every brand wants. And these people pay $99 and walking around thinking that they own the joint. I mean, but that's what you want as a, as, a, as a patron. And we have people who come to see five, six shows a month and spend hundreds of hundreds of dollars because they met their best friends at the City Winery. And they come back and they always sit in the same place. And they buy presents, Christmas and Hanukkah presents for our staff. I mean, that, when was the last time you bought anything to anyone in a, in a, in a, in a music club or a restaurant? You don't, it's, it's just, so we're really about this kind of interpersonal relationship so um, so I would say that that's kind of how we've we've established our fan base and we have a very loyal folks and 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 care and it gives us it, it's a double-edged sword because the more you give them as far as feeling at home and feeling hospitable and going above and beyond to try to accommodate their needs the more they'll be demanding but as a again as someone who's in hospitality that's ultimately what you want is you want someone to kind of feel that that connection with the place, and not, it's not just four walls with a city winery sign. Yeah. So in ballpark, what's the rent per month, and what's the uh, square foot? I know this because uh, our our build out in our new city winery is is so big. Um, Michael came to me said, uh, last week. He's like, you know. It cost us three hundred and seventy-five dollars an hour to be open every hour, and actually, if you take the fact that we're not we're not open from midnight to seven a.m., it's seven hundred dollars an hour. That's our rent. Wow. That's a lot of money. <laughs> and that doesn't include my salary. Everyone's salary doesn't include the cost of food. Doesn't include everything. That's a lot of money. Now, New York is extreme, but it's it ain't cheap. I mean. Our, all of our locations are a minimum of 25,000 square feet. So the one thing I think City Winery's done is great brand identification. And with that, you build a loyal following, the $99 people. And it's more than just them being able to buy City Winery wine or a branded T-shirt or something. So you, you guys have figured out a way of doing a classic line extension. So beyond just going to City Winery, you, you've been able to do events outside of the four walls um, to witness the fact that while you guys were homeless, you still had shows that continued the brand, but there's things that are identified as Michael Dorfer, City Winery Presents. And, um, and we're showing presence. I mean, exactly. We, we all think, and that's a good, humbling experience. I mean, we all think we all have certain scenarios in our life oh, like, they're not going to be able to ever survive without us or without me, or how can this person even, uh, you know, it's, it's a real humbling ex experience to go through a process where you like it or not, a city wants to close, artists still need a place to play, and people will still go see live music, and you'll just become this fade out, this kind of like, oh, remember city winery. So we, during the eight months that we were closed, we continued to build on a relationship with 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 an artist and with the fans and we were presenting shows all over all over the city to try to continue to have it wasn't really a money making thing for us but again to be able to have city winery presents at and to be able to send out emails once a week with shows and to be able to come and see some of the f artists that over the years have become friends with you know and to go visit them and to f them see that kind of so connectivity, is, I think, goes hand in hand with what we feel we, we, we are. But you've also been able to, with the brand extension, create special events. Yeah, I mean, we're doing, uh, we do these, these annual Carnegie Hall shows where we play homage to living legends. So we've done Rolling Stones and The Who and Paul Simon and uh, Led Zeppelin and, and so on and so forth. And we basically take... 21 artists all performing one song of their favorite artist in Carnegie Hall, which is 
you know, probably the, one of the most famous venues in the world. And we raised a hundred thousand dollars for music education programs. And we have a concept that we really believe at City Wine, which is called selfish philanthropy, because it's basically we're doing this to be able to uh, um, build the relationship with the artist and to be able to do these high-profile shows, but to use this and actually raise money for causes that we believe in. And we've been able to get some of the top artists in the world to be able to come to play in these shows for $1,000 to play one song when these artists sometimes get hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and, and, and I think for a couple of reasons. One, we've had a great tradition and we create a really comfortable environment for the artists that are coming to play. They're playing for a great cause and they know that a lot of these tributes that you see, people end up spending so much money and paying themselves so much that they end up writing a $2,000 check for charity and we actually write $100,000 worth of checks. And it helps that a lot of these artists, even that some of the biggest artists in the world have never played Carnegie Hall. So we're giving them the opportunity to play Carnegie Hall. Um, so we were doing these and we produced, we produced last week, I don't know if you've ever heard of Harry Belafonte. So he celebrated his 93rd birthday, and uh, we did a show uh, with him in, in, um, in the Apollo Theater, which was a, a great experience. And it's again, it's, it's, it's using these relationships through that we've established through City Wine to be able to call an artist directly and say, hey, are you willing to do this? And, and, and most of them pretty much say yes. And of course, it helps that we live in New York City, where there's so much great town that lives here. That also helps. What, what would you look back, what, what, what would you say was one of your better successes that you're most proud of as far as in your current role at City Winery? I think breaking the glass ceiling and what people thought would be, a sh would be show or artists that would play in a 300 seat room. Um, any particular artist that comes to mind that you... I mean, we've had, let's see, James Taylor, we've had Neil Young, we've had Prince, like I said, we've had Stone Temple Pilots, we've had uh, Deer Tick, I mean, it just, it just a, 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 a whole variety. So I think there's just... And once you break that sin and you're able to get these artists to play, then no one could say, you know, the question is always like, who else played, you know, this room? So I was like, oh, well, here's all the people that played. Um, and then I'm really proud of how we've been able to use our brand. We've established ourselves as such a great place for musicians that we're doing more and more of these city winery tours um, where we basically take an artist and uh, we did 30 nights with Joan Armour trading. And we, she, you know, she knows that she comes to city winery, she gets treat, treat, treated well, she gets paid well. And, and, Remember, if you're a big artist, even if you're playing Madison Square Garden, every single day you're playing a different venue. You're finishing, a, you're finishing, you never get to enjoy the city you're playing in. You're sleeping in because you're a rock and roller. You then go to sound check. You play the show on the same stage or the same lighting with the same blah, blah, blah. You pack in, you go into your tour bus, you go drive all night, and then you do the same thing the next day. What we're creating is basically taking an artist that would normally play 2,000 seat theaters and say, you know what? We have, place, we have City Winery in New York, in Boston, in Philadelphia, in DC, in Chicago, in Nashville, in Atlanta, all great places. We're gonna take you out for 30 days. We're gonna have you play four nights in each venue. So after the first night where you get to sound check and do what I just said that you do every single day, the next three days, you don't have to come to sound check. You don't have to do load in. You don't have to load out. You get to go shopping in your favorite clothing store in Soho. <coughs> you go to the fish market. You go to the High Line. You go to hang out. You get to hang out with your friends for three or four days. There's something very refreshing for those artists to be able to do three or four nights in the same place. And we're recreating the same exact experience in every city winery. So really the only other venue or brand that does it is Live Nation. Because Live Nation says, okay, guys, and we're not Live Nation, but they're saying, Lumineers, here's $25 million. You're only playing Live Nation venues all over the United States. I don't care what history you have. You're only playing with us. 
we're not really doing that. And, I'm, and someone says, oh, I actually have a history in the Birchmere in D.C. and you're not playing. I'm not saying right now, currently saying, screw you. We're not doing, we're doing all or nothing because I just, that's not my personality. <coughs> and I don't think we're, we're paying enough to be able to demand that. But how great it is to be able to see a poster with 26 nights with the magnetic fields, which is, you know, one of my favorite bands. And to be able to kind of see all of that and seeing, wow, they're playing seven different cities, 26 nights, and basically taking... It used to be, oh my God, Shlomo just called, and I have to do this favor, and I'm just playing New York. Now it's like, okay, well, if you're doing a favor to play in New York, we'll also route you through Philadelphia and Boston and D.C. So those, I would say, finding, getting these underplay shows with underplay meaning an artist that plays much bigger rooms to play small rooms, and the city winery tours are probably the two. Um, Denzel had a question. He wanted to know, who would you love to book for City Winery? It's on your wish list. Eddie Vedder, who is playing a private event unless it cancels on May 7th. Cancel. So I see that at stores playing City Winery. I don't care how, somehow I'll get him in. So we got him in through that way. It's the San Diego connection. That's Pearl Jam. I mean, there's very few bands I was exposed to as a kid. Uh, in Israel, there's, you know, again, one, one radio station. That's why I always, always love Suzanne Vega. For some reason, Suzanne Vega is one of those artists that has always played on the radio. Um, and when people say, oh, who do you, do you think you're ever going to, you think you're ever going to get a person? It's just, I just say, it's just a matter of time, way, angle. I'll find a way to get someone in. Um, I would say Eddie Vedder is kind of on the soul. Okay, so we talked about your wish list. We talked about your successes. What's one? What would you look back and say? What was a misjudgment that you <clears throat> didn't? You I can't take over. full ownership on the uh, full blame because I didn't make that decision. But I would definitely say that opening up City Winery in Napa was a massive failure for us. Napa is a small town north of San Francisco that cannot support a bodega and we decided to open up a venue and do seven shows a week over there and we I don't know if you've ever seen Tarantino like old Japanese horror movies where there's like blood splashing all over the place that's we were bleeding money that way just like so we so we you know we we learned a we learned a humble lesson and we quit while we were behind and for five years after we closed we were still playing rent um, so that was a big Mistake. Um, what about booking? It's funny. I don't know if most of you guys know, but uh, the band War. Oh yeah. yeah. Which some of you guys may not know, but I could play twenty songs and you're like, "Oh, that's War," <laughs> which is part of a big reason why they they probably have more one hundred top hit list you know songs than any other band. But we lost our pants on that one. Um, because you think identity? People just didn't know who they were, uh, which is crazy. But again, and it, and it was, a, I would say, early on, uh, I was venting to you. We have Daughtry playing City Wire in April. Uh, looks like that may be the new biggest loser of all time for us. <laughs> Unless well, we have five weeks to change it. We're, we're losing big on that. But that's a perfect example that, you know, we've... So a lot of these reality TV shows stars do massive numbers outside the big cities. Right. Because it's, you know, it's usually markets that don't really get to see a lot of celebrities and, you know, they don't work hard as like New Yorkers and they, you know, they, they are home by five and they have lots of time to watch TV. Um, so these, you know, these uh, American Idols you know, and all these kind of stars sell two, three thousand tickets in the market. But then they come play in the big cities and they, they're worth a hundred tickets. So we thought Daughtry, since he, you know, he, I think he's one of the few reality stars that moved on and actually had his own pretty successful solo career, yep. that we could maybe uh, change that. But we were failing so far. Knowing that it's five weeks out, what as the marketing guy also, what are you doing? What is your five week plan? Well, the fun. Well, the funny thing is, you know, there's always that battle between marketing and, and booking, right? 
if you, it's like a, it's like a, a, a professional. Again, I'll use another analogy from from a professional, you know, team. If you win the championship, the players did a phenomenal job, man. The players really stepped up and played great. If you lose, have a season, it's like this coach is horrible, right? So, same thing with the marketing and programming. If the show sells out. Oh man, we did a great job booking the show. If the show bombs and does terrible, God, these we gotta replace these marketing people. They don't know what they're doing. So <laughs> to to answer your question, uh five weeks out, what we're doing is uh we called the agent, told him he's a piece of shit for selling us a show. Um <laughs> then after we got 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 that out of the system, um <laughs> uh, we asked to have a call with a manager and then we kind of try to drive a, a marketing plan. And I think, of course, they're like, why aren't you spending money on radio? And like, guess what? We're a 300 capacity room. We don't really have, if you're playing Madison Square Garden, there is a budget line that says $15,000 or $10,000 goes to radio. And there's, you know, if you go see a show at Forest Hills, there's $25,000 dedicated for the first four shows to do marketing in all the subway stations. When you're a 300 capacity room, you have $250 to do Facebook ads. You know, that's the type of kind of variation. So I think we're gonna, we had uh, Daughtry put together a little video saying how excited to play City Winery in the new room. That didn't really sell too many tickets. Um, we're probably gonna have to spend some money on marketing and ultimately, we're, in my head, we're going to do one of two things. We're going to try to condense it, maybe two shows into one and make one of the show goes, go away and focus on one show or ask for a uh, deduction, which agents hate hearing the word deduction. But guess what? I always pitch. It's we're in this ecosystem, right? The ag I hate when agents tell me, oh, what are you talking about? We gave you these sellouts. No. We, together, gave your artist who's giving, because of your artist who's giving us the business, we, we gave him a sellout together as opposed to an agent's kind of talking you down. There's a lot of like kind of sub battles between agent and managers and venues and it's your fault, it's not your fault. It's, so there's, there's a bunch of layers I don't want to necessarily. Mm -hmm. Would you go to Groupon? No. So Groupon is, you know, it used to be, Groupon used to be a big thing for us. Groupon cheapens the brand. And that's a good question as far as, you know, let's say there's a show there's only 200 people sold, but we want to make sure the room is full because we make the money from F&B, from selling food and beverages. And we want to do giveaways and we want to do discount tickets. It's really important not to be able to, hit, not to hit the same list that you sold the tickets to and say, hey, we're doing two for one or 50% off because people are like, what is this? I'm, I'm now I feel like a sucker because I paid full price, or and now people you, now you have a pattern where people are now waiting right. too late to buy tickets. So we have to find other creative ways that doesn't don't cheapen our brand, that we could still get people in the room, still collect some money, and and so there's a balance act there. Last week we had Jarrell here from the PNC, and and it's her understanding, and it seems to be Live Nation's normal is they use Groupon all the time. The Live Nation cares a little less about what the people think about it. They think about the bottom line much more than, than we do. And, and when you're trying to move, if you're trying to move 15,000 tickets or 10,000 tickets, I would probably care a little less about Groupon. I would just, if the, if the, because the show is bombing. If City Winery undersells, I could probably move and take away some tables and chairs. Guess what, if you're playing an arena, and you sold only 50 seats up front, mm -hmm. good luck trying to hide. <laughs> Point. Point. A um, couple of questions from the uh, peanut gallery here. Um, Crystal wanted to know, uh, because you're involved in marketing and programming, how important is it to market social with via social media platforms? And are there certain ones you seem to favor more than others? Or is it just marketing anywhere to reach your audience? You, I think we have a certain, we have to be able to cast a net and a, I would say, a, a wider or smaller net. For the most part, Facebook is, and Facebook and Instagram are our are, are best friends, especially Facebook, because any marketing that you could 
see, okay, I put X amount of dollars and it gave me this amount of return is a great tool to have, right? I mean, <clears throat> there's certain markets like Atlanta where people drive a lot. And, and even though you can't judge if someone bought a ticket from listening to a radio station, any promoter will tell you to be able to sell a ticket, you base, for the most part, you have to touch people three times. It usually is, I heard it on the radio, I saw it somewhere in, the, in a paper, in a magazine, or some billboard, a friend told me I bought a ticket. Or I heard it on the radio, I got hit one time, and I got an email, and then I saw a Facebook ad, I bought a ticket. It's very rarely that people buy a ticket on the first time. So you have to be able to, when you market it, and even though not everything you do will have a exact return or a, a, or a, a return that is measurable, you need to be able to catch an net and know that, you know, from, from me, any city I go, any paper I open, if it's a New Yorker, New York Times, if it's a weekly street magazine, the first thing I do is I look at the, at the music ads. I look at who's, who's playing where. Most people are not active consumers, right? I'm in the business, that's what I do. I would say most, the average Joe does not, first thing they do, move back to, you know, move to that ad. So, you, so how do you get in front of them multiple times? And we feel with our 300 capacity, you're, we should always, in our minds, we should always sell 300 tickets. We feel that there's always 300 people who are going to want to go see good music. Do we sell it every single time? No, because we're not able to really reach most people. How, where are those people? Where, how do I get to you in your home? How do I get, how do I create this path in this world filled of noise and other information to be able to get you? So for us, it's just a matter of we didn't do a good job to get to those people as opposed to anything else. So there, there's, there's, I don't know if that answers, but we try to, diversify as much as possible, email, us, a lot of Facebook, and we also partner with WFUV, which we feel is, um, has a really close alignment with our brand and with the type of music. And This is kind of a, a combination question. It goes kind of back to the Daughtry thing. When you're marketing your tickets, do you feel that you are marketing to sell that artist, or are you relying on the artist to bring the fans into your establishment if you're just relying on artists you're a fool because you have to be able to have a base right and um but that's a great question especially with city winery most of the artists that play city winery the steve earls the shane o'connor's the whatever they don't have social media they don't and you know these days everyone from age two to 90 use facebook but still most people don't have following and they don't have a way to do it so we will so we have to rely on ourselves Whereas what has been extremely successful for us in the past year and a half is podcasts. Podcast is like the perfect programming for us. It has almost no, almost no production needs. Someone with a microphone. I, could t I know for a fact that this person has 50,000 downloads you know, a month. In my area, I know exactly where those, where those downloads are because that information is available for me. Guess what? They'll be talking about playing City Winery on their podcast. So those have, those have become kind of my, our favorite uh, type of programming, and we're doing more and more of those because, and it's folks that are crazy stuff, like, you know, a, a podcast that talks about sub-characters in Disney movies and stuff. The, the, I, don't, I didn't even know that even exists, but they have a loyal following, and they have a direct path to those followers. So we do look at social and we do look at following. I think it's much more relevant for some of the other venues in town that do up, that have up and coming that are much more engaged with their fan base. Daughtry is probably more <coughs> does have a follow, does have a following, but they're not as enthusiastic as they were for like you know a younger kind of hipper band. Um, it's part of the it's part of the um, equation, but for specifically for us with our core audience, um, we have to find other ways and not rely just on their social media. Because I could harp all day. Can you please put a post? But if he has fifteen followers, it it, it really doesn't move the needle. How far in advance are you booking? So to add another you know another layer of challenges for our specific job, we have to. Sh 
share our space with private events. So I'll give you an example because an artist one asked me, when we do a show, a sold out show, and let's say we netted $4,000 on the concert and we sold $14,000 worth of F&B. We walked out at the venue after we paid salaries and the barbacks and, the, and the, the, the minimum wage, all that. We walked on a sold out show, packed house, 350 people, two hours drinking and eating. We walked out with about $2,000 net. There comes a corporate event and you want 15 servers? You're paying for 15 servers. You want crystal glassware? You get glassware. The, the client pays for everything. So the margins on profit are much, 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 much higher on private events than there are shows. As a result, and because we are, we do a lot of these private events, we have to share the calendar with them. And that puts a lot of added pressure on, on concerts because the first two weeks, for example, of December or hot dates for private events for holiday parties. So normally we book about four or five months out, but depending on the month. July and August, we're not going to have any buyouts, any private events. We could book as many shows as we want. And it's, it's still hard because most artists don't want to tour in the summer. So we do that way in advance. January, February, not that strong for private events. So we book way in advance. But like March, April, uh, May, June, October, November, December, we have to leave certain dates open, like Saturdays are for weddings for the most part, but weddings you know way in advance. Um, corporate events usually are Wednesdays and Thursdays, so we normally the threshold, if there's nothing booked on a date that's not the first week of December, two and a half months out, we have the right to fill the date. And ultimately it falls on us to fill the date. Whereas the first two weeks of December, we have to wait up until a month out. So sometimes three weeks out, private events department says, okay, booking, sorry, we weren't able to book any private events on these four dates. And now it's up to us to fill those dates last minute, <laughs> which is a lot, a lot of pressure. Because again, no dark nights. Because my boss feels like if we had a dark night, you lost $12,000 because that's the $12,000 that we could have done on FNB. <clears throat> So, and, and you paid rent and you still had to pay salaries and all that stuff. So it's, it's a lot of juggling. Um, there's no clean fact. I mean, you know, Sundays for the most part are not for private events. So we book those way in advance. If it's a really big show, that's another advantage of having music people owning a music venue as opposed to someone else. If there's a really, really hot show, rarely do, do private events take president over over a show because it's such a cool show if it was a different non-music person they would only think about bottom line so not always the most smart decision from a business but again we're music people and we love the music well, Zachary was talking about climate change and you want to know what kinds of environmental sustainability programs the city winery uh, venues have great question very important for us uh, well, for the first, for the first, first thing, uh, all of our wine is uh, vegan and no sulfites, and we've saved, I think we've calculated, we save hundreds of thousands of bottles and glass and, and packaging because we go straight from the barrel, straight to the tap system. So that's one. Um, no plastic straws. We don't provide any uh, plastic bottles backstage in any city winery, so we have reusable branded, so people could also take it on the road. Um, and again, we've done a lot. You know, we do this thing called it's a it's a, a company retreat where we send every year all of our top managers. Last year it was 130 people. We sent people to New Orleans. We've sent people to Puerto Rico after the big storm to really help with our uh, uh, efforts to clean up and to, and to help the farmers that got hurt pretty badly from the storms a couple of years ago. So a lot of the, and, and, and again, we raise a lot of money for um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of brands and a lot of uh, causes are really important for us because we do feel as a brand that's just not, f just, it's, we're not just four walls and a sign where 
we feel that we have uh, uh, so a lot of social consciousness and a lot of social responsibilities. Um, so, I don't know, we do our best. Um, <clears throat> one of the other questions was, how much involved do you get in the other venues? Do you have to travel and go to and see these other I do travel. I probably travel less than what I need to because, again, it, if you're an artist, many, when we do these city winery tours, I try to tour as much as possible. Again, having an artist walk into city winery after seeing me years in New York, walk into city winery in Atlanta, and I'm there to greet him or her, gives that person so much satisfaction because it's some kind of similarity. And like I said in the beginning, one of the biggest challenges when we're growing a business like ours, within 10 years we have now seven locations, the construction is challenging, but you learn how to scale it. You learn how to, you know, you learn how to do the different SOPs and how to train the kitchen, how to, what menus do we want and what posters do we want. What you can really teach is the culture, and that's something that's really important for me and I, really important for the company. So being able to go to other, other city wineries and to really, uh, I would say, spread out our philosophy on how we feel artists should be treated and how we feel what our approach is is, a, is our or is probably our biggest challenge so i do tour a lot to spend some time with our programmers i spend time interacting with artists that know me and and just making sure that they're doing okay walking around just seeing certain stuff that other people don't see from are we promoting the right shows do we have the right postcards are to we is is you know again one of those things that really bothers me talking about you know in my OCD is you come to a show you come you you bought a hundred dollar tickets you come to a show at seven o'clock you spend your time you decide to we have so many options you spend three hours in our establishment you spend another hundred and fifty dollars on a great meal and and wine the show ends. Artist comes back on stage, standing ovation. Wow, what a great experience. The absolute thing that I hate as someone who goes to these shows is some f the server or manager who wants to go home turns out the light all the way up. For me, that's like, f you. you. I just spent four hours with you, spent all, such great money, and you just turn on the lights. All, that, for me, at least, that ruins my whole experience. Well, what about if it's the early show and you're trying to turn the house for the late show? We rarely do double shows, again, out of the choice because I don't want to be chasing the artists out of the green room. I don't want to be chasing they spend if they Most people disappear from the venue within 20... I mean, when we open, we envision people are going to go sh show up at 6 o'clock in the evening, spend two hours, then sh watch a show, then hang out two hours after. That obviously doesn't happen. Most people disappear. But that... 30 seconds, instead of turning the, the, the light all the way up, you just slowly, gradually, for me, makes an experience, a, a good experience or a bad experience. The, 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 you know, I've, I've, got, I've gotten fired three times from restaurants being a server because I am so conscious of the music that's playing in the background that I've changed, changed music and changed music and take over the playlist, and the, and, and the owner ends up firing me because it was like, fuck this, I have a... You know, I have a vision and, 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 and you're ruining for me or, or, or people don't care. So a playlist, you know, you have people come with different types of tastes of music, which is great. I'm, you know, I love all music in case someone asks me what music I like. I like all music. Um, but there's certain music that's not appropriate. If I'm sitting in a singer-songwriter vibe and, and, and someone pops in some really cheesy pop song before after the, sh before the, after the set, it's... You know, we're, we're trying to create an experience. An experience has, like I said before, there's so many steps. When I do the training, when we open up New City Wineries, I just say, there's so many ways to ruin an experience for a show. I mean, let's say, I'm, I'm, I'm taking you through the path real quick. I mean, you book a show, you paid lots of money, you did all your research, you did, everything is great. You book the show, the agent now gets the contract, sends it to the manager, the manager sends it to the tour manager, the artist on the road. You think I made the good show? No, there's the person who's advancing the hospitality, the person who's doing the production advance, the content manager that, that did, you know, uh, some people could complain it could be a great show. They got the wrong order in the green room, and that's what they remember because they played so many shows. 
there were only two loaders to load out of, for the van instead of three, like promised. That's the only thing they'll remember. So there's, during a, during a course of a show, from booking five months out, throughout leading up to, all the way to, you know, did, if, if my production manager did not convey that we don't have parking for the bus and the, and the bus driver shows up the day of the show, that's what's going to ruin the person. So the ruin, ruin, ruin the show. So there's, there, it, it, it's a, again a cliche, but you really need a village of beer to put a great show on because there's so many ways to get things wrong. The most important person in the room when a show is not me, it's not the, it, it's the production manager. If the, if he did a shitty job on the sound, if he did, if he turned on the light too much, if he. So I was going to say, how how do you control your hiring people for these different venues? As you said the end of a cool evening somebody plays a cheesy pop song how do you instill that in somebody saying you're going to screw this up and even if you install it i mean how do you inst how do you now instill that in seven different cities and how do you explain to them what cheese is if they don't have the same point of reference as you i'm doing the same thing i i, I sit and i look into the into their soul <laughs> and i say yeah, I, and because most people, most people don't think about it. Most people are not aware. No, they're not going to think about it. I think Katy Perry's cool. It's fine to play that at the end of a show that's a singer-songwriter. I'll play Katy Perry. How do you explain to me or that person? I say you. You're out of here. No, so. <laughs> well, fine, but but no. It, listen, you got to trust that person in Nashville. You, you, you got to trust, and most people who come and you know we're we're now hiring for City Wine in New York. We're hiring two hundred and twenty people. Oof. 220 people that any one of them could impact. They could mess it up. Mess it up. A busser, a, 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 a you know, a, 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 a loud waiter who's going to take the order while anything could change. So it, it comes down to like really being sincere and repetition and having someone like me or someone in my position, like a programmer who's not part of the show, active, you know, when I'm, when I go see a show and my, someone in my position goes to a show, we're not pulling bottles for a server. We're not going to the kitchen, finding out why there's a, why there's something that's, that's kind of floating. We're there just to kind of, we're the ambient setters, you know? So we're, we're, we're looking at stuff and we're observing stuff. And then hopefully the next day trying to give some creative feedback and good feedback for the folks. But there's, it happens all the time, and, right. it, and, it, and, it, and, you're, and it, for and me, you're it's just like, York. what else is happening that I have no idea of? Right. Somebody turned the house lights on too quick. Every business. I mean, that's why business owners end up having no life and really spending all their time in their business, because A, they're paranoid that someone's stealing from them, and two, uh, no one really could give the same, nobody has shares the exact same vision. Do the other locations have the $99 membership deal. Yep. So that's, and are they transferable? You could use your membership to buy tickets in any city winery. That's great. And you could buy tickets for other people too, which we eventually, we sometimes catch people that are trying to, scalpers that are, you know, buying 10 tickets, at, you know, without paying credit card fees. And again, we, and you know what I do? I've, I spent at least two phone calls a week Someone sends me a note. Oh, I see that, that they're selling the, uh, your tickets on, on, on StubHub or somewhere or, or some third. I call these people and say, "I'm sorry, sir. We're, we're unfortunately we're canceling your membership because you abused it." Or, "I'm Oof. sorry, we're we're uh, uh, you're you're basically overselling your ticket. Unfortunately, we're 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 we're, we're going to issue you a refund to your ticket. We're not allowing you to sell it. So it's, we care about those things." <laughs> Unlike other companies. But, yeah. <laughs> um, Adam asked the question, do you see yourself or do you covet one day that you move on to something bigger? I, I, have, I feel really good with where I am. I mean, I have, I, I, over the years, I've taken on more and more responsibilities. I could probably get paid three times as much being in Live Nation. For me, the most important, for me, someone's been in the job for a long time. One of the most important things for me in a job is I want to be in a, I want to be close to the center. I want to know what's going on. I want to be part of the decision making. I want to know that that I have a direct impact on the business, and I'm that. I'm 
been there since day one. I, we continue to grow. We continue to do stuff outside of our normal kind of comfort zone. I'm never bored. Do I ever want to work a little less? No. Yes. Um, but to answer your question, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with where I am. And I have no desire currently to put all my money in risk, you know, I think, and risk having my own. I think the first part of your answer might have something to do with your background as a team player and your athletics and that the way you want to be involved in from the get-go and and, as a, and you're a pivotal member of a team. I mean, we've all been in, we've all, we all have been in a position where if you don't know what's going on, the voices in your head start, you know, being louder and louder, like, what's going on? Are we going under? Are we not going under? Are we, are we being bought? Are we not being bought? Is the angry not being angry? The, the, these, all these conversations you have in your head, which if you're sitting in the, in the table, right. you're aware of, and you know what's going on. And I think that's, has always been a key thing for me because I've been in the other side and I've been where, you know, where I don't have control. If there's something that I don't like in the company, I have the control to change it, which, and not all my money is invested on, you know, like I'm, this is, you know, I'm not going to be rewarded as much as someone who owns 51% of the company, but I'm also not putting my livelihood. I think it just depending on the type of people, some people, you know, my younger brother, you know, sold, sold marijuana when he was 14 years old and he was never able to work after that because, like, it's, I have to work for myself all my life, right? Uh, I never had that. I have no problem working for someone else. I kind of have a weird analogy. Sorry about that. But um, <laughs> um, I, I feel comfortable with Ram, so, you know. Uh, and, and you know. And maybe, maybe, maybe I'll decide to go play pro again. No. <laughs> but but you know how privileged you are and how unique a situation it is because there are many people who would you know cut part of their fingers off to have the situation yeah. you have. And there's many aspects of my job that I well, of course. that I that I hate like everyone else. But it's rock and roll. I could dress like this. I could you know listen to great music. I interact with great people all the time, and I'm and I'm part of a business that, that brings joy to people, and, and I see that all the time, and it's something that has ex a lot of, a lot of uh, rewards. Well, I think all of us here can feel the same way about you being here tonight, and want to thank you for coming out tonight and doing this. Thank you.